hundreds of years before the famous Nazarene roamed the mountains of Galilee, Aristotle was teaching the men of Athens something called rhetoric. It was a new endeavor to the social order of their fledgling democracy. In his day, the term rhetoric is what we now know as persuasion. Greetings and welcome to an Odyssey in Territory. I'm your grateful host, Dan Riley. Training in rhetoric grew from a new way of governing. Societies and cultures in and around what is Greece today had abolished kings, oligarchs, and tyrants. They were determined to govern themselves. With this new form of government came the establishment of courts. Courts that allowed any citizen, irrespective of social status, to propose or oppose any law before the assembly. This exposed the disparity in communication skills between the elites and the common man. For the birth of Athenian democracy to endure, it required the average man to be skilled in rhetoric. Persuasion, wrote R.T. Oliver, is the civilized substitute for harsh authority and ruthless force. The way we teach public speaking today began with Aristotle and the way he taught rhetoric over two centuries ago. His method is still the bedrock of speech training in the Western world. To better understand why we teach what we teach in public speaking, we need to examine its foundation. Aristotle's model for persuasion included three modes, ethos, logos, and pathos, and they're known today as the rhetorical triangle. Ethos is establishing the totality of character, making one worthy to speak on a subject. If an audience is to be persuaded by a speaker, the audience must believe the speaker has the expertise, credibility, and trustworthiness on the subject. I'll use myself as an example. I'm going to speak to the local Rotary Club about supermarkets. In my speech, I'll tell them which market deserves their business. I established my ethos by informing them I worked in the grocery business for 40 years, holding positions from bagger to vice president. The audience would most likely grant me ethos and listen to me. Here are a couple of examples when audiences might find ethos questionable. Number one, Donald Trump speaking to a class of seminary students about the need for Bible study. Number two, the Dalai Lama ad advising finance majors on Bitcoin investments. Neither man's biography would appeal to the, those audiences. Ethos denied. Logos is the proof by way of facts, statistics, and data a speaker uses to ground their argument. Once the speaker has established the authority to speak on a topic, they use something akin to logic to drive the argument forward. It must be noted, although, logos and logic share the same root word, they are not the same thing. Logos in rhetoric refers to the clarity of the argument and the logic of the evidence and reason put forth, not logic as it's understood in mathematics and in computer sciences. When used effectively, logos is so convincing that an audience reaches a conclusion on their own before the speaker makes their closing argument or call to action. To do this, Aristotle suggested the strategies of syllogisms and what was then called commonplace. Syllogism is a way of combining two premises, then stating a new fact based on the component of each premise. Here's an example. All mammals are animals. All elephants are mammals. Therefore, all elephants are animals. Common plays are culturally specific aphorisms accepted as universal truths. By using common plays, a speaker is linking their logos to deep-rooted premises. Here are a few examples of common places. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. An ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. The pen is mightier than the sword. Staying with my example, I would tell the audience that supermarket A's prices are 10% higher than supermarket B's. Additionally, multiple ind independent research firms found that supermarket B's employees are friendlier than supermarket A's. My logos would be built on commonplace. In today's vernacular, commonplace is common sense. Lower prices are better than higher prices. And friendly employees are more desirable than less friendly employees. That's just common sense. It is important to remember this model was created to persuade an audience. The model presupposes a credible counter-argument exists. A common instruction given in most speech training programs is to state the counter-argument, then with logos, refute it. Aristotle taught there should be one more step. 
he thought it important to concede, or appear to concede, a contrary point of view, or at least an aspect of it. This would further add to the speaker's ethos, because he is honest, scrupulous, and trustworthy, and garner pathos from the audience. Our feelings are always stirred when we witness a person doing the right thing, especially if it's not in their own self-interest. But paradoxically, it is in their own self-interest. With my supermarket speech, I would inform the audience that although supermarket A has higher prices overall, they did, however, have lower prices on those items people buy most. Pathos is an appeal to emotion. A speaker's logic is much more persuasive if it is wrapped up in emotion. What feelings the speaker invokes depends on the audience and the speech topic. My intention is to persuade the audience to shop at Supermarket B. Making a pathos appeal, I tell them of a personal experience I had while shopping there. Late one afternoon, when I finished my shopping and returned to my car, I discovered the car battery was dead. Unbeknownst to me, one of the employees in the parking lot overheard me asking other customers if they had jumper cables. The next thing I know, a car pulls up beside me, and the employee asks, Where are you parked? Gratitude is a powerful and persuasive emotion. Aristotle believed ethos was the first among equals, and if an audience believed the speaker's right to be heard, they would be persuaded by their logos and pathos. In explaining these three modes of persuasion, I did it linear, but don't confuse this explanation with speech crafting. A speech should not be crafted ethos first, logos second, and pathos third. These are interconnected rhetorical appeals, independent of speech crafting. Think of a speech as a tapestry with ethos, logos, and pathos all woven through it. So the next time you're before an audience, bedazzle them with your ethos, bewitch them with your logos, and beguile them with your pathos. Doing that, you will have persuaded them. As for today and my part, that's all there is. If you found some value with this message, please consider following me on your podcasting hosting site. If watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing. This is Dan Riley taking you on an odyssey into oratory. Until next time, throw off the bowlers, sail away from the sea, catch the trade winds in your sails. We're on the move.